Good. Okay, um, welcome to the fifth uh, talk of our Wild Talk series. Um, we are organizing this series as part of our, our graduate research studio, uh, Rewilding the Metropolis. Um, and our uh, fifth presenter is uh, Fei Fei Zhu uh, from the Feral Atlas project. Um, let me briefly introduce her uh, before thanking her so much for agreeing to give a presentation to us. Um, Fefi uh, graduated uh, from the Royal College of Art with an MA in architecture uh, in uh, 2018. Um, and uh, she's interested in the commodification of the Matsuteki mushroom uh, in Shangri-La in the Yunnan province of China. Um, she has her BA in architecture from the University of Sheffield and she worked in uh, Kenga Kuman Associates in Shanghai and also Lifshutz Davidson and Sandilands Architect uh, in London, I think. Uh, she received the Dean's Prize with her graduating project, Salvaging the Forest, which is a beautiful project. I hope she will uh, present us uh, some uh, visuals from that project as well. Uh, we are in love with that. Uh, and uh, she um, was also nominated for uh, our IBA President's Medal uh, with that graduating project. Uh, and uh, after her graduation, uh, she was one of the co-curators of the digital publication uh, Feral Atlas, uh, a research project, a very interesting and layered research project, uh, along with anthropologist Anna Singh, uh, visual anthropologist Jennifer Deegan, environmental anthropologist Alder Kellerman Saxena. So thank you so much for joining us and I'll leave the floor to you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Unfortunately, I didn't prepare any material for the salvage forest. Um, I'm really sorry. Uh, maybe, maybe some other time. Um, but yeah, I've uh, kind of um, curated this talk around the work I've done for Fair Atlas, um, just through presenting my work. And um, also, I have presented um, um, the material at several other venues. So if you have watched me talk, I apologize for <laughs> sharing the same materials. I hope you're not too bored of uh, my drawings yet. Um, so I'm just gonna start sharing screen. Mm. Ooh, can you can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Can you see a video playing? Uh, not yet. Yes, it will come soon. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. So, Fair Atlas is a digital research project on the Anthropocene through studying the non human entanglement with human made infrastructure projects. It combines 79 first hand situated field reports from scientists, humanists, and artists with artistic interventions such as spatial diagrams, videos, and sound clips, watercolor illustrations, and etc. And together, we created this complex playful and experimental atlas of studying the Anthropocene from a more than human perspective. Um, it's a transdisciplinary collaboration on a vast scale. As someone from architectural background, I worked alongside the anthropologists, um, Anna Singh, Jennifer Deeger, and Alda Kellerman Saxena as co-curators. And in a collective of more than 200 contributors, makers, collaborators, and volunteers. We believe that to study the intricacy of the Anthropocene, we have to listen to different voices and perspectives and approach from different angles and methods. So, um, fair effects and infrastructures. Fair Atlas is um, an Anthropocene atlas of ferality. So the ferality or the fair effects indicates the undesigned, unexpected and out of control effects that imperial and industrial infrastructures have been creating and spreading into the ecological world. Feral here comes with neither negative or positive meanings. So feral effects are all around us and they can be wonderful or terrible. Flora, flora and fauna reproduce and follow their own cycles and rhythms beyond human activities all the time. So here, um, an apple tree thrives after a forest visitor toss the core after eating an apple or jellyfish invade the Black Sea and cause ecological disaster after being accidentally brought, brought there through ballast water in cargo ships. So these are merely two examples of the fair effects. 
There are Atlas studies infrastructure projects that upset formerly stable non-human cycles and rhythms and lead to ecological state changes, causing ecological disasters. And the term infrastructure here refers to human built infrastructure uh, landscape modification projects that emerge within social and political programs, including plantations, deforestation, urbanization, and global transport route, and so on and so forth. For example, cargo ships transport thousands of tons of passion laced, laced timber as commercial building project uh, materials every day. So this kind of industrial transfer leads to forests to be overwhelmed by insects and pathogens so intensively that they might not recover. So here, um, this is a photo I took almost three years ago in San Francisco of Andy Goesworthy's sculpture Spire. And um, if you can see these kind of um, marks, um, so I was quite fascinated by these kind of semiotic patterns. And later on Feral Atlas, I realized they are actually trails left by bark beetles, which transmit pathogens across trees, which are probably introduced by timber importation across the globe. These diseases could cause and have caused continental plant pandemics. Pest and pathogen have always moved, but in this case, the infrastructure of commercial transportation have created an ecological state change through sheer intensity and scale. So the anthropocene detonator landscapes. Um, to convert the argument that the Atlas is trying to make on infrastructure processes, but in an intriguing and comprehensive way that draws people's attention to details, we came up with these um, four large scale illustrations which we call the Anthropocene Detonator Landscapes. They are experiments in visualizing the Anthropocene using fantastical juxtapositions of landscape modifications across time, location, and scale, but with real historical references. They tell horrible stories in beautiful ways. So each landscape come with a name, invasion, empire, capital, and acceleration. And each was triggered by particular historical conjunctures that have led to anthropogenic, anthropogenic environmental issues. So hence the name Anthropocene Detonators. So architects throughout trainings offer a particular set of skills of noticing, representing and analyzing, especially in relation to the built environment and structures that us humans have observed, designed and occupied over time. We argue that the Anthropocene is patchy and uneven. So scale become crucial in order to observe these patchiness proliferated through infrastructure works and spread by Earth systems. So our combined spatial analysis with narrative illustrations and allowed scales, chronology and location to emerge without any given order um, and restrictions through the whole making process of these drawings. So this way, we can show multiple world making processes from different time periods at different places together on one single canvas. So um, because each Anthropocene detonator gives form to an aspect of the world condition, each will demand to be viewed from a particular viewpoint. After the viewpoint is established, all the other drawing elements emerge quite organically for me. And the viewpoint here have two meanings. One is a perspective of viewing or drawing. For example, the kind of terms very familiar for us architects, plan, elevation, axle, 2.3 point perspective. Um, and another meaning is a point of view. So whose point of view? We want you to really pay attention to ways of perceiving the world through the imaginary lenses of specific socially and historically situated individuals, whether human or non-human. So it's also key for us to collaborate with black, indigenous and minority artists to allow them to tell their own stories in their own ways, especially uh, when depicting, depicting these infrastructure developments based on violence and exploitations. Um, so I'm going to go through each of the drawings in detail. Invasion lies on this long axes that show the vast and almost endless expanse of unexplored landscape. Just imagine yourself as, a, as an explorer where your journey starts from the right and continues toward the left. Starting with various colonial ships, here you're looking at Santa Maria ship, 
which took Christ Christopher Columbus across Atlantic Ocean for the first time in the late 15th century. This is a British Navy ship, the Man of War in the 19th century. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the black ships that depict in this kind of Japanese art style. And the black ship is the name that the Japanese referred um, to the Western invaders ship in the mid 19th century. And arriving at the shore, causing various forms of violence and resistance. Here we're looking at the human forms and here are the non-human forms. This is the burning of the Amazon um, caused by cattle farming. And then progress to the European gardens are these kind of um, anthropogenically modified landscapes uh, where processes of invasion still continue to today. And to talk about invasion, we have to learn from indigenous communities perspectives. This is our collaboration with Aboriginal Australian artist Nancy McDinney. And this painting of hers on invasion shows a striking scene of her great grandfather defend their lands against the first wave of mining prospectors. This is a painting showing colonial uh, encounter and resistance. And here we're looking at another collaboration with the First Nation Canadian artist Andy Everson, and um, whose drawing depicts a glacier that's significant for the Comox community in British Columbia, um, which is also disappearing at alarming rate due to climate change. So these two drawings show different um, forms of violence and destruction, but they each record history and the present. Empire shows a different sets of land and water scape modification project led by Imperial Force. So here, let's imagine yourself as an Imperial Surveyor, standing on top of the hill and examine the changes from near to far. So see the peasant's farm in a Southeast Asian landscape. Here we're looking at cassava, rice, gradually merge into colonial crops. Here we're looking at opium, tea, teak, and eventually turn into full-scale colonial plantations, the teak and sugarcane plantation, followed by a water management project like dams, canals, botanical gardens, and modification carry on towards a metropole and close to the shore with intensified imperial establishment, including slave ports and trading ports. As well as is this um, hybrid island with features from the greater Caribbean and also the southern US, we can see um, the kind of sugarcane plantation um, going on but right next to a cruise ship, just showing how these exportations of human and non-human resources exist, but just in different forms. And here on Empire, we have a commissioned piece um, by the Ghanaian British artist and architect Larry Botchway, who is also a friend of mine. His research looked at palm oil plantation in Ghana, which is commercially controlled by Ghanaian-based European-owned agro-industrial companies. So he shows um, that how people resisting this agriculture colonization by tearing the contract um, kind of here that tie them up with the industrial farming. Um, drawing capital from an actual view was kind of an architect's instinct for me. So ax ax axonometric view offered this kind of skill but uniform way of perceiving objects. So just like the capitalist, the first thing I did to draw um, capital was making a grid. On this grid, everything exists in parallel and gets standardized. Grid help create this um, homogenous landscape we now live in. So look, look at these infrastructures that we can recognize from all over, almost all over the world. They're just modules on replication, such as um, plantations and factory blocks. But pay attention to the failing of the grids and order. Look at the burning of Fukushima, the industrial and domestic water wastewater discharge and causing these algal blooms and dam breaking the order of urban systems, slums merge into resin blocks and also the smoke, the exhaust, industrial dump being released everywhere in these working and failing processes of uh, infrastructures, very effects are emerging and spreading. 
Um, acceleration offers you another viewpoint, a non-human's viewpoint, that's um, looking up from underneath the clock of marine plastic in the ocean. So acceleration is a time where the end of World War II and production has accelerated at an unprecedented rate. So this in also includes the production of waste and toxins. According to the UN, by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean by weight than fish. Just because we dump the plastic in the ocean and we don't see it anymore doesn't mean it doesn't exist. See from this marine life's point of view, in this claustrophobic and contaminated environment that human has created, threatening your livelihood, intoxicating your bodies. Look at this industrial sewage and agricultural runoffs creeping into the soil of our resi blocks. The use of antibiotics uh, on piglets in pork factories. The ballast water in cargo ships accidentally introduced new species to the ecosystems and causing devastation, which I mentioned before. And of course, the dumping of plastic waste. These waste and pollutant produced by infrastructure sweep through each other and get mixed up, turning the world into a giant soup of dump. And here um, we see these kind of two collage pieces that's taken from P Filipino duo um, Amy Lee and Enzo Camacho, whose contemporary artwork center around this um, mythological figure called Manolongo. She's a monster with split bodies and haunts the neighborhood. Um, in the Atlas, Monolongo represents an un, um, unstoppable and intangible force that's guiding us in the world of acceleration. So she's lingering on top of this um, kind of hiding away industrial soy farm in the Philippines and overlooking a whole world of pollution, exhaust and toxicity. And her legs are caught up um, in the plastic jungle. She lingers, but she's also stuck. So just like us, there's nowhere to hide. So when the reality is too dense, um, metaphorical features help us to take a moment and contemplate. Um, so I thought I'd just um, take a moment to summarize the three points I picked up from working on Fair Atlas. First is importance of transdisciplinary collaborations, especially um, for us as architects with natural and social scientists. Um, and, you know, especially when architects are designing with ecolo ecology, but I also don't think this should limit to just ecologically related designs, because arguably any architectural design in the Anthropocene now is ecologically concerned. And secondly, it's crucial to notice before designing, to think, to think in advance of long-term spatial um, effects rather than focusing on just immediate problem solving especially um, solely reliant on technology. And this is kind of where ferality goes wrong. And third point is to shift perspectives. Um, we should be aware that our architecture is for both humans and non-humans, even if it's indirect. So we are um, cohabiting and sharing a space with the non-humans together. And you also shift, so shifting perspectives help us to think across scales as well. So, for example, we have a case um, on anti-fouling paint, that is this paint used on cruise ships um, by anthropologist Natalia Brichet. So, a cruise ship is a large transportation infrastructure to humanize, so in a human scale. Um, and the chemical compound TBT that's using anti-fouling paint is a microscopic scale, which is very easy to be ignored. Whereas the fair effects it has caused and bring to certain species of sea nails and essentially have stopped them from reproducing completely, is the scale is incredibly vast and arguably planetary. So our architecture shouldn't provide shelter on certain crowd and, um, and ignoring certain scales, which should, um, should not be based on exploitations on other habitats. This includes non-humans. Um, so I guess I'll just end here. And apologies on um, not talking more about other work, but I hope um, you found it interesting. Yes, yes, of course we did. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the beautiful presentation. Um, I'll now open the floor to questions and comments. 
Uh, can I start with one? Yes, please. Okay. Um, thank you so much for this fantastic visuals. But in terms of content as well, um, I think there is um, this palpable anti-imperialist or anti-capitalist sort of um, critique of the infrastructure and architecture. Um, and I think um, it shows also the vulnerability of um, human-made um, sort of large-scale infrastructure projects. And um, I was thinking what your thoughts on um, the future of infrastructure, um, and especially uh, given that uh, climate crisis is near and global warming and sea level rise um, and uh, the expected um, environmental refugee situation. Um, so what do you imagine um, the future of infrastructure and deliverables um, for many millions of people? Um, like what would be the scale of it? Do you imagine um, large scale versus um, small interventions, especially mm -hmm. in the, in the um, third world countries and in the informal settlements, um, say in Africa? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think firstly, the kind of future of infrastructure, that's like such a vast question, you know. Um, but it's interesting, I've been talking to um, another architect, Alexandra, oh, I can't, can't remember her last name. She's um, studying, um, she's teaching at University of Te Texas, but also kind of doing this, she got the Wheelwright grants to look at greenhouses. And we had this really, really fascinating conversation um, say infrastructure of greenhouses that the first thing to think about is how architecture can move or infrastructure can move beyond human centric views that greenhouses essentially host plants and at the same time it will also kind of co-host insects or other kind of um, non-human um, living um, you know living critters and still that greenhouses is designed center around human, you know, the height, the, 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 the material even, and the temperature or temperature and not still, yes, temperature. And everything is very kind of bizarre. Um, in a way we feel like we have completely um, ignored our um, protagonist, protagonist in this case. So I feel like it would be really interesting to kind of really include non-humans into architecture. And this does not mean to you know, shelters for non-human. Mm -hmm. This also means just everything around non-humans. You know, I've kind of discussed so much recently about our domestic houses. There's always spiders, mice, you know, um, mosquitoes, flies. And we're always just kind of so scared of all these kind of living creatures. But somehow they're just like part of our environment. And uh, the other question was the scale of it. Um, that's another really interesting question I've been thinking a lot about because talking about infrastructures and also globalization is unavoidably kind of think about a systematic kind of infrastructure design. But at the same time, I feel like, could there be a kind of primary um, structure of the infrastructure design, but can be applied with kind of, a, be adapted to local um, um, context and environments? because we see the, a lot of kind of so-called failure of infrastructure mm -hmm. is merely copying the same module into kind of everywhere in the world, which, which you ignore that it's completely different climate. We have completely different culture and history and the, the soil have different nutritions, you know, the, the ocean have different depth. So we really have to start from, I think, small scale and um, elevate it up, which is also interesting that to, collaborate with anthropologists to see how, you know, each of them have a topic and spend years in that location. Whereas I feel like sometimes maybe architect might be a little bit careless in terms of us designing kind of re in a remote um, location that we just feel like we can just put a design there um, without really investing into the local context and, and culture and talking to the people and see what they want and what really works in the long term, you know, we now have to really think how the building have effects in like 10 years, 15 years, 100 years, because we're seeing this very effects coming from 100 years back, you know, colonial time and mm -hmm. um, get kind of tumbled in the history of development and causing all these effects. 
So a really big talk, topic, but definitely really worth exploring. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you so much for sharing this beautiful presentation. We were really all impressed by them in Fair Atlas. Um, and there's something I want to uh, ask. Um, it's a duality, actually, that I sometimes get stuck in. And I wonder about uh, your approach, actually. Um, in your presentation, you said that to tell horrible stories in beautiful ways. Um, I always like this kind of visualization, uh, and it's a method I try to prefer and try to create. But uh, while doing this, um, I also worry about solving serious issues in a um, so optimistic way. Um, did you have mm -hmm. such a concern while creating Inferior Atlas with the team? Or um, how do you approach this duality personally? What's your uh, perspective about this mm. subject? Yeah, I love your question. It's been kind of another, another thing I've discuss a lot and thought a lot because I have to admit working on Ferro Atlas has put me into a very kind of strange position that obviously it affects the way I see around the world. It really does make me see these fair effects everywhere and really notice things I've kind of taken for granted and just kind of see them as just normal daily goings of the, the, the infrastructure, the world. And now I can, I can see how, how um, fucked up essentially excuse my language and it really kind of give me strange like I don't know how to position myself as I still see myself as a kind of younger generation you know in the world and working on Feral Atlas there was kind of another um, discussion on you know optimism is also a, a, a big discussion in other fields you know ecological fields or just design fields um, the, the the end grow of goal of Fair Atlas is not to kind of like present just kind of blunt optimism, optimism. It's more to kind of um, make sure that people, when they talk about climate change, when they talk about these kind of very dense um, topics, they don't think, oh, no, 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 it's, it's nothing to do with me, or I don't want to talk about this because this, this, is too, this is too depressing. It's more kind of to introduce you that these are what's what's happening. So to see that as a way of this is so necessary for everybody to know, how can we use our ways to, to draw people's attention in to introduce this study, to tell everyone that this is really happening. So it's kind of more um, sharing, spreading the knowledge rather than uh, putting ourselves into kind of a mere op op optimistic position. Um, and also, you know, like, when we talk about fairy effects, um, like I mentioned very briefly before, it's not all kind of negative, it's not all bad, because the world has accidentally created some very beautiful things. Um, I'm sure you guys have read The Mushroom at the End of the World, that's a very good example of, you know, the capital capitalist rooms that actually created this, like, very beautiful mustache mushroom, somehow later became this, like, um, valuable mushroom that kind of got tangled up into, like, the, the supply chain, this and that, but still, this is um, this is why I think the ferality is quite beautiful and romantic in its own sense because you can't control it. You know, you can't control what's coming coming up because it's merely out of human control, which is why we study these fair effects. So I think what we can do is just to study and um, try to you know let people know that this is what's going on because the awareness is like the foundation of everything really. I hope I answered you. your question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Az, az önce değindiğimiz konuda e, aslında insanların farkına varması evet ilk adım ve sonraki adımda da belki de şey olması gerekiyor. Nasıl ki e, kapitalizm bütün araçlarıyla çevrili biçimde e, insanların 
e, onları kullanabileceği tullar yaratıyorsa e, belki de bu e, ekolojik bir bakış açısından e, farkına varılan şeylerin bir de ekolojik bir alternatifini üretmemiz gerekiyor belki de. Bunu insanlara tavsiyemiz ya bu yanlış şeylerden vazgeçirebilmemiz için. E, ben böyle düşünüyorum. Yerel politikalar olarak da böyle şeyler yapmamız gerekiyor bence. Um, so thank you as thank you for your comment did you have a question um just to summarize or uh, was it uh, just a comment Fatime başka bir sorun da var mıydı yoksa yanlış özetlemeyeyim diye soruyorum hocam bu araçları aslında nasıl geliştirebiliriz onun için de ne gibi yöntemler e, düşünür ya da bu konuda ne düşünüyor onu da merak ediyorum. Bu araçları derken bu farkındalık yaratma araçlarını mı? E, farkındalık yaratma ve sonrasında da buna alternatif hani insanların tamam. yapabilmesi için ne gibi bir alternatif? Okay. Uh, so um, I'll try to summarize uh, and if I leave something out, please uh, correct uh, me, uh, Zeynep. So uh, Fatime uh, has talked about the importance of creating awareness uh, under uh, the, you know, the effects of capitalism and how, uh, how can we develop the tools for creating awareness and how can we develop some uh, alternatives to what we have uh, observed. Um, I, I think that was it yeah yeah how to present ecological alternatives i think yeah. as equally important as the awareness um so she's mm -hmm. um asking you about the the tools of that perhaps yeah. yeah this is um perhaps the next step of my career is coming up with um tools or um i would like to think architecture interventions and i think all the all the questions and um kind of comments we talk about is kind of centered around that right because we are architects and we can't help stop still become like problem solvers that is my biggest frustration is i'm drawing these drawings and i kind of just feel oh i'm just kind of presenting the problems i'm not doing anything mm. um so um yeah i've i've kind of get in contact with a lot of architects um brilliant architects around the world who are doing um, this kind of architecture interventions, very ecologically based, very non-human based. Um, my tutors at the RCA, for instance, cooking sections have done a few interventions um, around topics such as um, salmon farming mm -hmm. or um, toxicity in, in water. Um, for me, I'm because I'm kind of um, with our, uh, with Fair Atlas and studying infrastructure, it kind of quite naturally, it, um elevate it into infrastructural scale which is um quite global scale so then how the architecture intervention can be applied into kind of infrastructure scale is the biggest challenge and um, so for me i would i would really i think my my entry point would be i would, I'll be really interested into teaching and start to kind of based around different areas and having very kind of um, specific context into these kind of um, where ferality is going wrong um, or kind of ecologically disastrous um, events happening and start from there and kind of working backwards maybe on coming up with like several different um, local based architectural inventions and to really kind of put into analysis overall and see how we can come up with something that's common that's different and what strategy we can extract from that to like use into more of like a global or planetary scale and it actually is similar method i've been doing my drawing as well i'm kind of pinpointing these kind of very individual elements and then eventually that come all together and make it as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much you. for your comment. Other questions, comments? 
Um, could you tell us a little bit more maybe about the history uh, of your involvement with uh, this research project? Um, how uh, did you get involved with Aura? Was it related to your graduation project? Uh, because I, I mean, obviously there's a continuity, but we would really like to hear more about that. Yeah. So I, okay, so I was in my second year of my master's degree in the RCA in the Royal College of Art. I know I was very interested in food. I know I was interested in something to do with my own country and culture, so essentially China. And I was, since growing up, I was very kind of sentimental with ecology and nature. So I remember I was watching this food program called The Bite of China, I think. First episode, first um, season, it was mastake mushroom. And it's the first time I've, I've seen this mushroom. And I thought it's so interesting because it grows on the tree root. So it's a way of almost like a policy loophole of revi reviving this kind of like ways of human destructing forests and there's a way to protect it. And when I got into this, my tutor said, you should read Anderson's book, which I did. And it was very fascinating, but Anna's research was more kind of based in, um, I think Oregon so in the US. So I was still kind of really interested to talk to her about um, kind of the part in, in China that I'm kind of working on. And then I was, you know, having a field trip in San Francisco. So I sent her an email. By chance, she was in Santa Cruz. So I said, um, can we, can I meet you? She said, yes. <laughs> so uh, I went to Santa Cruz, had a dinner with her. And that's when, you know, I was showing her my drawings. So the kind of salvaging the forest drawings is a way of, also, so basically when I graduated, I had just one drawings, um, rather than kind of series of plan section elevation, I just put everything together. So I was presenting my drawing to her and Anna said, I have this project called Fair Atlas um, that um, I'm looking for, um, you know, um, preferably architects who can draw. And then it kind of naturally <laughs> got it. Um, in my journal. and we did actually touch base on because Anna is half Chinese and we were talking about like Chinese art style because um, especially invasion I have borrowed this kind of long scroll painting which is like ancient Chinese style it's very kind of narrative based and we were also both looking at um, Anna's journey and um, it's this Japanese uh, children's book is also a very kind of narrative based um, kind of illustrations but also kind of um, tell very detailed informations and narratives about um, what it's trying to say. So we kind of borrowed a lot from the presence of Asian art and started collaborating. And um, it's actually really interesting that before I joined, or even just when I joined, we have no idea what this drawing is going to look like. None of us knew what it's going to look like. So it's really kind of bouncing around ideas, very intensive discussions and they're very quick like working with anthropologists is very quick just kind of sketching out the ideas and we're like this is it <laughs> <laughs> so everything happened really fast but but really fun and another another thing i learned from working with acad acad academia or like academic kind of crowd is they always try to change stuff and this was kind of frustrating in the beginning and now i'm so used to it so my drawing, you can see kind of a bit emptiness mm -hmm. um, or some bits like look quite deliberately undone. Um, one, one point is that was kind of um, a point we tried to make, you know, it's like we don't want to fill up all these drawings with very kind of pre-designed colors or drawings because woes is like it's still involving like all four of these um anthropocene detonators they still continues today none of us has ever stopped mm -hmm. um the second point is i have to kind of make spaces in case they want to add something else yeah um, yeah so actually acceleration um the kind of bullet train and the building that's just hiding behind the monolong goal or below monolong goal was for coronavirus mm -hmm. and that's when we decided to add this entry i think it was around april and my drawing was done like the year before, but last minute we have to add these elements because we're having a new entry. So these drawings are still kind of evolving, um, probably not now, but who knows, maybe <laughs> in the future as well. 
<laughs> and could you talk a little bit about the studio uh, that you took, the, the cooking sections, your tutors, how did they affect your approach? Did they um, affect how you approach the problem or your definition mm -hmm. of the problem? Because we looked uh, at your drawing in last class uh, quite a lot. Um, uh, the final drawings you produced mm. for uh, for that. Um, yeah, studio. yeah. I mean, I I have cooking sections have had a really big influence on me. I have to say, I feel like my my ways of approaching um, topics or problems and the ways of like a representation. Uh -huh. um, is largely kind of influenced by them, but what's, what's really, I, I think very brilliant of the, with their way of teaching is they have very set, like uh, defined sets of kind of um, teaching kind of guides maybe mm -hmm. that say each, each project you have to find um, a title or mm -hmm. um, supply chain, um, which can be like human characters as well and your fund, and then your, you know, this and that, and then you, you start to progress. Each week, they come with a little task you have to, to apply. So then we kind of constantly being pushed to think how the project evolve, but at the same time, say, um, they like to encourage people to do one big drawing. Mm. So that's actually from them. So they encourage you to, how do you kind of like blend plan into a section and the section blend into elevation? and then add a bit like illustrations around. But basically I have never done hand drawings before second year. I always use computer drawings. Really? And yeah. yeah, and then I always use kind of Illustrator to, to draw this like almost doodles of um, these Tibetan villages where they kind of um, pick the mushrooms. And then my tutor said, they look very like, it's, it's a bit wrong to, to draw something so kind of earthy and so kind of, local in in kind of straight lines there's something wrong with it and then uh, one of my tutor Alan just saw my sketchbook and he's he said oh it looks like you can draw I said I can't draw I'm just like doodling he said try it and then I've never gone back to computer drawing <laughs> so that was that was really fun because I feel like um they have kind of never really taught us to to use any choice of medium is whatever suits us and whatever suits a project really. You know, some some other people did a, com a complete kind of, I don't know, Rhino or AutoCAD um, based on CAD drawing because it works in that project. Whereas for me, when I found, you know, I, I really enjoy hand pencil drawing because lines are wiggly. And that's like, I feel like how um, Tibetan architecture gave me that impression and the color palette as well is I went, when I went to the, the village um, because it's largely based around Tibetan Buddhism, they use a lot of like dark blue, dark red is because of the local mining. Um, that's also what kind of color palette they use for, you know, the, the drawings, the religious drawings of like Buddhist, Buddhism, um, which it kind of gave me also a little bit confidence of studying it because I always feel this dilemma of studying like other cultures, you know, I feel like I really want to, study deep enough but then the time you know we only have one year to do this project um so i just want to kind of do it as much as i can to kind of more pay respect to what i can um learn and grasp in that limited time so yeah thank you and what um i also what, wanted to talk a little bit about the critter drawings um oh, yeah. how did they come about um and, oh wow yeah <laughs> that's <laughs> another about that yeah whole long story actually critter drawings was drawn before i became the the maker of the critter drawings mm -hmm. they were kind of again illustrator um kind of do the line drawings and then we we came about kind of different ways. And I remember having a chat with Anna and she said, I don't want dead, dead critters. I don't want kind of like natural um, history museum kind of insects drawings of like a dead insect lying there. I want something more liveliness. Mm -hmm. And then we discussed a lot. And then we thought, you know, what's the most live, like for us, there's a brilliant way of capture liveliness is the kind of Chinese ink paintings. 
I don't know if you guys have kind of like seen it. It's so simple. It's just kind of like very limited color plan. Sometimes it's just black ink. Mm. And um, it doesn't have that much detail, but it really captures the movement. And it's more kind of about the atmosphere it's trying to create. So then we actually went all the way into kind of Chinese ink painting and that even like learned ink painting from a, 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 this kind of master I found in my hometown and wow. eventually job. Chinese ink painting is not something I can learn in like a few days. Yeah. <laughs> I've done it, I've, I've approved, it's not happening. <laughs> so then um, eventually we came back to watercolor and um, I had help from a, a, another friend who's a girl in the year below me, um, Maria Saiki. And she's kind of very good at watercolor painting. So we were kind of working back to back um, so using watercolor, but it's carrying on the same principle, you know, kind of not too much detail mm. and capture the critters about the movement rather than kind of something that is very still and positioned. Um, Do you mind, uh, in the meantime, can I share the screen and show your pa uh, critter paintings um, just from the internet? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I yeah. think some are really incredible, incredibly expressive. I mean, so I really wanted to. Okay, um, and do please keep talking. Yeah, and um, actually, for we we were in um, Istanbul. Um, oh. by an, yeah, and um, then we hired an animator in New York who made this like little movement, the animations on the critters, and um, it's curated by um, Jennifer D, another co-editor, and um, Victor Baskin, who's um, another maker. Of their atlas and they were kind of projecting the the critter moving on the door which is the first thing you see entering fair atlas it's just like them kind of just like going around <laughs> <laughs> it was it was really really fun um but yeah and some of them is um it's this is candida so some some of them are quite scientific and also like microscopic mm -hmm. and what's interesting is for coronavirus um, I think if you go on the Fair Alice website, um, you will see instead of drawing, you know, coronavirus, we normally see as the the coral is like a little like spike thing um, going on. We didn't really want to like draw that. So instead we drew um, the protein spikes. Um, yeah, if you go to um, coronavirus, yeah, just, just a bit. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, any of them. Um, I just can't. Um, yeah, just move move to the right. Yeah, and then click on the names. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. And then if you scroll down a little bit. Um, also, this is a very beautiful flow map that our map, map maker, Lily Carr, who's another architect from the AA, has yeah. made is kind of like a, a, a record of different kind of like cluster of um births of coronavirus cases happening in different um huh. locations and different times of the world to show how kind of class of human in crowded spaces have like made this um virus kind of spread so much faster and easier huh. than we anticipated um so the critter drawing just kind of a little bit below this map um, oh, yeah, just that. That's yeah. the protein spike. Yeah, this one? and yeah, mm -hmm. and something something that I also didn't uh, really know before coming on Fair Atlas. That I've learned a lot um, mm -hmm. from kind of just like how how different scales perceive into like represent representing a critter, and I think the protein spike is probably the smallest scale we've drawn um of all critters and some are kind of animals which is more just um recognizable critters yeah yep yeah. um okay i'm not very good with this mm. i'll just Sorry, stop where would you... now <laughs> it's just okay. yep yeah. um Yeah, I really hope to find an opportunity to publish all these kind of animated critters. They're the cutest thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
definitely. Other questions, comments? Uh, I want to say something. Uh, thank you for inspiring uh, presentation. I think it's your drivings all inspi inspiring all of us. And I want to say, I think you are highlighting important point about storytelling. Uh, you show us different stories and relationship inside your drawings. And there is a different uh, kind of symbiotic relationship and also collaboration with uh, interdisciplinary way. And I think it's a powerful, powerful way to uh, understanding and telling the stories. It's really important to talk for me and what we have and what, what can we do as an architect. And I just wondering uh, this process, how it impact, impacts your juxtaposition and how did it change your perspective to reading symbiotic relationship? I think it's still question about your drawings because I think we all impressed about it. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the, the question, um, the, the, the last bit, please? Uh, I am asking about the process about your collaboration and interdisciplinary way working mm -hmm. and how this process impact your <clears throat> juxtaposition of representation and how did it change your perspective to looking, reading symbiotic relationship? Um, symbiotic relationship? Yeah, you said that in your mm -hmm. uh, presentation. Yeah, um, I mean, one thing I've definitely learned of from these drawings is to draw with scientifically accurate um, matters and materials. I think there was a danger. I've, I've um, had some discussions with the map maker, Lily, um, in the project is there is this bad habit sometimes of architects that, you know, when we draw and when we do renders, we kind of just whack whatever we can find on the internet and <laughs> into our drawings, you know, and sometimes that, that can be, you know, it's because we're on deadlines. And at the same time, it's because we don't really know the context of sometimes like the, the project we're studying on. And that was a, a, a strictly no-no in, in Fair Atlas. Mm. Um, I have spent about four days just trying to find the right type of cassava in the Southeast Asia that's happening like during colonial time. And um, sorry, it says my internet is unstable. Can you still hear me? Yes, yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Um, just this kind of persistence from from Anna seeing of this this is not the right plant we cannot present it and it's quite impressive for me and really taught me a lesson of be extremely careful with what you draw um even though you know like these um drawings I'm, I'm calling them like fantastic juxtapositions of different infrastructure projects it does come with kind of a fantastic imaginary um perspective right because it's not it's, it's it, the the way is composed com composite together is is not real but then each element is still a real historical event and uh, we we do make sure that we don't offend history we don't offend culture we don't offend um the way nature operates and the way like critters not operate so this is also kind of pay respect firstly to what we draw from a maker of these drawings and also to make sure everybody can comprehend the drawings, because this is not just for you know artists or architects. This is also for um, people who might not know that much about art. This is also for scientists who care so much about the accuracy of the drawings. So um, even though you know Fair Alice is a very specific project, is a huge collaboration, is open to a various audience. But I feel like this is something maybe us architects can still pick up is when we draw. Be extremely careful and cautious about what we draw and do studies of like every element we put on our, our canvas or our drawing paper just put some thoughts on it and that's something i think it will be um great to pass on thank you and we are in the same process now i think you all inspire us 
Oh, thank you. Thank you for your kind comment. Um, well, are you guys in master degrees, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and how many years for your master degree? Two. Two years. Okay. Yeah. Two. Yeah. <laughs> but this is just a semester long so project. Um, okay. Yeah. So it doesn't go on for, for the whole year. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we do have, um, if you go to the, what we call the super index, which is, you know, when you collect the key on the left corner of the website, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you go to the kind of like text master page, which we call the super index. Okay. You, um, well, Shall I go yeah. now or? Oh, just kind of a FYI kind of um, yeah, yeah. Yes. A, a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a reading room. And then the last uh, bits of the reading room is teaching guide. So if you guys are interested in mm -hmm. um, using Gerales as um, teaching guide, there's like different syllabus written for kind of um, different purposes. And I have actually made uh, one for kind of like Arctic students, but coming more from the, the maps point of view. So, mm -hmm. you know, every entry they have of what we call the flow map. That's the first thing you see when we enter the, um, the, the article or the essay. Um, and each map is either kind of handmade by our map makers and other members, um, including myself, or we have kind of like researched and used it because it really fits what the article is trying to say. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's also a re really good way um, for architecture students to kind of study because what we're trying to capture is these unseen elements is, is the flow or like what brings a flow you know the things we we can't grasp wind temperature water you know soil these things that's like kind of constantly moving which um, is so hard to grasp but we what we're trying to do is is to present it in the kind of like um comprehensible or it's like a, a way that can be that can be seen that can be captured um to show why these very effects are spread through um the help of infrastructure um i just uh copied the the, the link here uh, i hope it's the correct link to to the chat um it's from the in the sensing index it's the yeah. syllabus for sensing the anthropocene is that i think it's um I think it's design. The other, is sorry, my, my internet is that, not that's okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I I got it. Oh, that's syllabus three. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I do hope um, everyone enjoy browsing through Fair Atlas. Is um, mm -hmm. is a hefty we call it a hefty baby of um, years of efforts and um tears <laughs> I swear <laughs> um so yeah i really hope you guys enjoyed it we do and it shows you. that it's uh, an incredible amount of work a really layered scientific and artistic achievement i really really love it um thank you any more comments or questions If, I think it's getting late in Shanghai, so we should probably let our host it's rest for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. No, it was, it was great um, talking to you guys. And I think the questions are all very brilliant. I was, I was really happy to hear um, all the questions, I think. And yeah. And I really hope, like, use Fair Alice as um, educational material as much as you like. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, w I would love to see kind of archi architecture interventions coming up because of the, or like according to the materials we have there. And I think the authors will be really happy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We should much. share our students' um, work at the end of the semester with Fei Fei um, by sending her a link. If you could look at it, that would be lovely. Um, thank you so yeah. much because you can see the uh, inspiration you drew in them. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It was amazing. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I'm going to probably go.